In this episode, paramedicine, should it be a college degree? This is Medic Life, a weekly video podcast for EMS professionals, bringing you real-world knowledge about today's EMS with your host, John Newton. Lifers, it's time for your weekly dose of Medic Life, where we delve into everyday EMS topics. I'm your host, John Newton. There in Texas is my ho- co-host, Marty D. And this week, we're talking about paramedicine as a college degree with Boomer. Hey, if this is your first time watching or listening, thanks for coming. You might want to stick around this week because, yes, we do have a little special code that will help you save money on your continuing education boomer welcome back glad you could join us again hey uh why don't you start out uh by telling everybody how to get in contact with you and stuff and that stuff is going to be in the uh description there but tell everybody how to get in contact with you oh cool uh easiest way would be to follow me on twitter at the notorious jcb awesome cool marty how you doing man awesome How's the weather in Texas? Beautiful today. It's That's like beautiful. Mid sixties, perfect. Well, it's good. We don't want you to get too cold. That would be terrible. <laughs> Heartbreaking for all of us. Hey man, um, it is sixty four here in Georgia right now. Just updated, looked at the phone there. Sixty four, man, here in Georgia. You're where are you at again there, Boomer? I'm in Rentham, Mass, just outside of Foxborough, and it is not sixty four degrees. It is a warm thirty four. Could be oh, 16. We'll take 34. No, we'll take 34 all day, every day. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. So uh, after your last show, we jibber jabbered a little bit, and you sent me a text message. That was like, hey, I was having a conversation <laughs> with some guys, and uh, I've been seeing some of the same stuff. We talk about this in EMS all the time, but you sent me this text message. Hey, John, can we talk about paramedicine? And college degrees and all this stuff. And I was like, you know what? I think we're ready for that. All right. I like um, it. We're going to do a little series, I think, here. Just a little short series on education. And I think uh, this will be a good way to kick it off. So you're going to kick off our education series nice. here. And we're going to talk about, um, well, just EMS education and why degrees are important. All right. Marty, you... Uh, you got a couple of degrees under your belt. Do you think it's made a difference for you in your field? Uh, yes and no. So I started out initially in college with going towards an account an accounting degree, right? Yeah. Believe it or not, in the midst of coming to understand that I absolutely hated accounting, I tried to get into um, <clears throat> kind of uh, – I decided that I wanted to be a neurologist, believe it or not. But in order to get into the, yeah, in order to get into the pre-med program at Notre Dame, I had to kind of take another three years of school, undergrad, in order to get to the graduate level. So what they told me was, you know, if you want to get out of accounting, get out of accounting. Um, There was a consulting degree that was sponsored by Accenture. So we could understand the ins and outs of a business, how to take them from red to black, all that stuff. Here's what they said that was interesting that's related to medicine is that uh, they said, look, a lot of the hospital systems are looking for MBAs in order to run them. So they want you to get a BA in business, go to medical school because you'll you'll get fairly – you'll get accepted better if you're a pre-med and then get your MBA and then you can run hospitals. But – I did none none of that, and I took none of no, that advice. Yeah, <laughs> no, my degree, my degrees helped me with connections and kind of maybe a line of thought, but not not in your case where it's more practical every day. I've got to learn this stuff to save lives. So you have a couple of degrees, right there, Boomer? I do, I do. I owe a whole lot of people a whole lot of money. <laughs> uh, no shit, man. I do too. Uh, <laughs> What are your degrees in? Um, so I have an associate's degree in paramedicine. 
um, and I have a bachelor's degree in medical biology with a focus on a pre, um, pre-medicinal studies. So PA medic school or medical school. So is your uh, associates actually say p- associates in paramedicine? So it's an associates in applied science and healthcare, and then I BS you not in parentheses it says paramedicine. So mine says an associates in applied science, health science, EMS. Ooh, very nice. So, yeah, I finished paramedic school, and that's kind of what my associate's degree said. Now, I, now I'm the, kind of the oddball in the group. Uh, I actually have a bachelor's of science in history and English. I'm an Americanist, so uh, it's American history and uh, American uh, literature, although, yes, I do speak uh, not the Queen's English. I speak Southern <laughs> English. Uh, American. <laughs> y'all, I speak come kind of silly English, right? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help myself. Uh, <laughs> way too much coffee today. As I drink from my mason jar. Yeah, yeah that's not water. Yeah. We know. Sorry. Right. Yeah, it's a little shiny. <laughs> so this is going to go off the wheels really quick, guys. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, I'm just kidding. It is water. Um, so I, as some preparation for this, I did a little research, and... I was surprised actually to see how many uh, bachelor's programs in EMS were out there. Um, 20 of them, bachelor's that are recognized in EMS. Uh, and this, and I'll just tell you guys, this came from NAEMT's website. They okay. listed 20 of them. There may be more, but these are the ones that are kind of known. And most people know people like West Cal- uh, Carolina, or it's Western Carolina, uh, what Eastern Kentucky, uh, those folks at the University of Maryland in Baltimore, so the UMBC guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, and, you know, just a few others. George Washington's got a couple, I believe, GW. Yeah, yeah. yeah GW's got one uh, in uh, EMS. Uh, those folks at the University of South Alabama, uh, they're in Mobile, oh, or as probably you guys from up north call it, Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so I was actually really surprised to see that there were that many of them. And believe it or not, you'll take a guess at the number of graduate that are listed. How many graduate five. programs? You said five, Marty. Yeah, I'd say the same. There's actually four uh, listed. So uh, close. One of them is the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. GW is the other one. The UMBC folks and Western Carolina. So uh, I thought that was right. kind of interesting. What would you use that for? Well, that is an excellent question. What would be the purpose? And that was actually on the show notes. What's the purpose of a graduate degree? I don't know. What do you think the purpose is there, uh, Boomer? Of a graduate level degree? Yeah, an EMS. That's a good question. Um, I'm sure administratively it'd be helpful. I mean, as Marty can attest, in most graduate level courses, you learn a lot of administrative and business aspects. Um on the clinical side of the coin? I don't know. I really don't. So I, we were, as I was thinking about how we were going to approach this show, I thought about the hierarchy. So maybe let's start at the bottom and talk about how each one of these different um, levels kind of fit in. And not so much from just the providing care, but how it might provide structure to EMS. Because, I mean, do you agree, Boomer, there's not a lot of structure in None. EMS? Zero. Yeah, I mean, I think we said that in one of the previous episodes. We talked about that before, You just you and I outside of this and how there's, yeah. You know, we talked a little bit about the money in one episode, and we talked about why you would do this. But, yeah, I think we need to add some structure. So um, you got certificate programs and associate degree programs probably in your area, right? Yeah, the, the paramedic academy that I went to had a certificate program. And in the specific program in New York that I went to, you simply said, I want an associate's or I'm just doing the certificate program. And if you were in the associate's program, you did five additional, so I think 15 or 18 more credits of coursework in varying sciences and psychology. And they had a whole curriculum planned out for you. But you walked across the stage with an associate's degree, whereas everyone else who just went to paramedic school got a certificate in paramedicine it's interesting that you just said school so you can and and 
I, I like to use the term uh, Bob's Backyard, but uh, you can go to Bob's Backyard and take a paramedic certificate program, right? Sure can. See, that was kind of interesting to me. So um, my EMS training, I'm actually originally from Alabama. Yeah, I live in Georgia, and probably for you guys, it's like splitting hairs, whatever. He's from the There's South. <sighs> Uh, do you really have running water or not? Does it really matter? <laughs> How many teeth do you have? Uh, but now um, in Alabama, it was you went to a college or you didn't go to a program. It just it didn't happen at all levels. Now, once now some of the colleges, and there's a few of the colleges that you could get a certificate or like you said, you could choose to do the associates program. Uh, I went to actually two different schools. Uh, I went to one in South Alabama. I went to uh, Calhoun, uh, excuse me, Southern Union uh, State Community College. I got my EMT basic and my uh, intermediate. And then when I moved back to North Alabama, where I'm originally from, I went to Calhoun Community College and finished my paramedic and then my associates. But both of the schools actually had associates programs. You just sort of kind of had to pick if you wanted to do it or not. So I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, – when I moved to Georgia to find out that, yeah, it's like that, but, you know, it's not just Georgia. You know, you're there in, uh, you know, uh, Massachusetts and Maine and Maryland and Pennsylvania and probably even in Texas. And, you know, there's a lot of states that you <coughs> can just have those programs where you can do just certificates, which is really weird uh, to me. Um, for your associate certificate get you, though? Can you actually become a paramedic with this? Yeah. Group? Oh yeah. Yeah. There's no once you've completed the curriculum and you take the test, there's no change whatsoever. So if the school is accredited or the Bob's Backyard program is accredited and National Registry accepts it, yes, those students can sit for the exact same test that everybody else can. That state will accept them and give them uh, their license or certificate or whatever they're calling it in that state. Um, the only difference that really and truly in between the associates and the certificate program is like a math and class, a history class, an English class, maybe some science or something. It's science just a class. few. Yeah, it's just like four or five little classes. But you, in all honesty, I mean, do you agree, Boomer, that those are probably necessary? Yeah, I think that's always been my biggest stronghold. You know, it, paramedics as a whole want more autonomy. They want more medicine. They want more practice. They want more money for all of that additional work, but, and now it, just in defense of my alma mater, you know, I went to an accredited two-year university that had a fantastic paramedic program. You just chose, do you want an associate's or do you want a certificate? But when you talk about those Bob backyard programs, and even in the uh, st well-known accredited paramedic program that I went to, my anatomy and physiology course was bare bones to say the least. So it you didn't like, actually, so you took an EMS A&P class. Yeah, yeah, I took I took a poor man's EMS AMP class, head, shoulders, wow. knees, toes, and a little bit of a little bit of physiology. And that wow. was it. So the uh, program that I was in, I actually went and sat in the AMP class just like everybody else that took AMP at that sure. school. As you should, and I think that's yeah. when you talk about you know making that fight for college degrees on the clinical side of the coin. When I was in undergrad. I'd been a practicing paramedic for just about four years, and I'm in a full year, um, what my university did was they called it AP and P, Anatomy, Physiology, and Pathophysiology, yeah. where you'd do A and P, and then you'd... It's you'd like 201 and 202 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, That's so the same thing I did, yeah. Yeah, it was a full year, and they broke it down by systems, and then you did Pathophysiology in lab as you went. Yeah. And the light bulbs of why I was giving the medications I was given how I was treating my patients, what better underlying picture I had of the care that I'd provided was tremendous. Now, it didn't affect my protocol. It didn't affect the dose of Salimedrol that I gave. But when we talk about becoming more autonomous clinicians, you have to have that basis. Being able to ask and answer the why question. Right. You, you can't, we can't ask you, and as an educator, we all know Bloom's taxonomy, right? As you yes. break down your level of understanding, you can't ask why if you don't know the fundamentals of human anatomy and human physiology and, and your generic EMS A&P course that I've seen, that I've taken, that I've been part of, that I've helped teach, just don't give that to you. How do we expect our clinicians now to become better if we give them the same crappy schooling that was fine 20 years ago that just doesn't meet the standard of today's paramedic? 
does that still exist where people can take kind of the basic read? I, I think it's it's kind of yeah. common. Yeah, it's common. Yeah, my my A and P course in my paramedic academy was one semester without a lab. Really? I saw a job opening uh, posted up here in the local area, one of the local community colleges uh, specifically. They were looking for people who were paramedics who had experience that felt comfortable and could teach that particular. And it was billed as a biology class, but it was designed specifically for healthcare providers. So you could people you you could get people that become paramedics and ride on an ambulance and not know the foundation of how my body works. Um, how are you saying, or am I reading this wrong? Well, I, I don't think it's – John, please interrupt me if, if you think I'm mistaken. I, the foundation is the same. Like the, the fundamentals are the same, and I think they're taught regardless. But when you branch out into that higher level thinking of what specifically is going on with my patient, how can I manage it, what needs to be performed in order to better management, just it's, isn't there. I, I think the fundamentals are there, which is why it's called – I think the, it's the, the depth of information. Key, but, yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's just skimming the surface and just to torque a whole lot of people off. When we talk about nurses being better healthcare providers, they took a whole lot more school than most of us did, and they all sat through a full year anatomy and physiology course that. So that's what is that what, what is did. said that nurses are better healthcare providers than paramedics and T's? Try not go down this road. <laughs> I saw your face there. It, um, Do we want to say I think that, on the paramedicine side of things? Well, no, it's not that they're better provi better providers. They're different. Their thought process is different. We're more about trying to – well, we show up in the worst part, worst day you've ever had in your life, and we're there to heal you, to keep you alive, to kind of hold you together. And so it's a different mindset because – uh, we're more, and even with ER nurses, and I'm probably just about to piss my wife off and about half the friends that I have. She's but even, hearing you right now, yeah. Uh, yeah, she's downstairs, so uh, yeah, she's <laughs> probably hearing me. Uh, but um, <clears throat> nurses, even in the ER, are a lot like paramedics, but the, still the mentality is a little different. It's more about... Um, I don't know. It's just a different kind of care. I won't say better. I think it's a different kind of care. But you're right. I think the education has made it a different kind of care. Yeah, I mean, and and as Marty being being a little out of the medical field, there there's a literal nursing model of practice of their approach to patients, of their approach to healthcare, of their management in the healthcare system that is very very different than protocol based medicine that and uh, and an emergency ba management of that that paramedics are taught. So, like, we're literally taught two different approaches to patient care, but when when people bark back and forth about who's the better clinician, first and foremost, it's apples and oranges, because nurses and paramedics aren't tasked to do the same job as one another. But the nurse has gone through a whole lot more education for the majority of individuals than your average paramedic on the road. So, here's how to make that argument. When we go from associate's degree level, and I think we probably can all agree... Uh, that an associate's level is really something that we just really need to at least be trying to take that first step for everybody to be on the associate's level. But if we make that step from associate's to bachelor's degree program, and this is something that um, I talk about sometimes to my students is, is ha and how we're not prepared, but there are some of those classes like, do you think, and, and this is just you from a personal level, and I know you've probably taken some of those because you're trying to go a different route within medicine, but Psychology classes, sociology classes, do you think that by EMS professionals having to take those to – because that's a lot of the extra classes outside the EMS yeah. stuff. Do you think that would make us better clinicians by taking those kind of classes? I don't think there's such a thing as bad education. I mean I think they're bad educators, and I think you can, <laughs> you can get more from one, from one individual than another. But I think any program that you put out there – under the right scope or with the right mindset can benefit you as a clinician. I, and I think, well, here's the basis for me asking that question is because, and I, and I feel like this as um, somebody who's been doing this for 20 plus years, and yeah, I've taken some psych classes and some sociology classes, but I still feel like that when you graduate from even an associate's level class, 
And I don't know. I've looked at some of these bachelor's programs, and I'm thinking it's maybe not going to still be that much different. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I've noticed from these uh, programs and how they sort of kind of interact. But I think that when we start talking about death and dying, we start talking about dealing with kids and death and dying. We start talking about things like rape and this, that, and the other. We don't have the tools in our toolbox from a psychological, from a psychology standpoint to really help our patients right um and i think that was the kind of the basis of me asking you that question is as we take that step from associates to bachelors and we incorporate those kind of things people say oh well bachelor's degree is not going to make you be a better clinician but i mean do you think that's a good argument i mean i i think i think rather than asking your paramedics to just obtain a bachelor's degree and take that additional coursework i think a better discussion to have is how to make an effective paramedic program two years instead of one and incorporate a lot of those modalities in that program. Yeah, I just made that face when you said one. You did. I, I mean, in many, my paramedic program was a year from start to finish. Wow. And you got an associate's degree for two years worth of work? Yeah. My paramedic, what... <laughs> my par- my paramedic program. So I did basic EMT, and then, right. so that was one semester. Yeah, Inter- yeah. So your paramedic was... program wasn't two years. Okay. Your, your time from advanced to paramedic wasn't two years. Your time from not working in an ambulance to being a paramedic was two years. No. Uh, intermediate was two semesters, and paramedic was three. Right. Yeah. So your, so your, it was so your like... paramedic program was was less than a full academic year. Just no. your paramedic program. No. No. My. My param- the actual just paramedic portion yeah. was three semesters, so technically it was a full academic year plus another uh, half. So we went fall, spring, and then fall again. Oh, yeah. You, you said semesters. I'm thinking quarters. So let's, don't mind me. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so yeah, we did so... it in semesters. So quarters it probably would have been a little different uh, because, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. The programs were – and that's what's – that's the thing, too. We've got to find a standard. We've got to find a standard to how we do these programs. You know, people, I see people all the time on these different blogs. Hey, what do you think about this uh, abbreviated program where you go for six months? And then when you start asking them questions, you find out, well, okay, yes, they're going eight hours a day, Monday through Friday for six months. And you go, <coughs> holy crap. Right. But, yeah, I think that's probably realistic if you're going eight hours a day, five days a week for six months. Yeah, sure. that's probably realistic. Sure. I mean, my, my, just, just the paramedic aspect of my curriculum sounds like it was identical to yours. You know, I, I did, I did a different basic to get into paramedic school transition, but I had a, I had a three semester course. The, it was fall, winter, summer was clinicals. And then the following fall was the end out, all the rest of the stuff, get ready to test in the winter. But they had a they had a night program at the same university that I went to that was a two year program only because it was abbreviated only because or, or rather it was longer because you were doing it yeah you know now that I think about it we didn't go into summer so we did fall spring fall springs what we did yeah I right. remember yeah so because and it was at night it was a night program we went you know like I don't know three or four nights a week but you know and I. I don't know how many clinical hours. Ours was like somewhere like pretty close to a grand or more of clinical hours. Yeah, yeah. Medical. As soon as you said that, and I don't remember off the top of my head, but as soon as you said that, twelve hundred popped into my head, and I think yeah. that was everything combined. Yeah. But you know, it was a different time too. Now the programs are more inclusive, so you do basic EMT, and then you kind of start the paramedic portion and after you get through a certain part i think some of them allow you to test for advanced emt yeah, yeah. still yeah. still keep going and then you do the paramedic so uh yeah it's kind of different yeah that, that that's not too far off from mine um we affectionately refer to ours as a zero to hero program you got your emt in the first semester then you could practice as an emt while you were finishing while starting your advanced level stuff midway through your paramedic you got a little card that said you can now intubate and start IVs under the supervision of blah, blah, blah. So like a pseudo advanced EMT, you couldn't go out and practice alone, but it almost gave you like wiggle room on your precepting time. And then you completed your paramedic curriculum out there. I don't, I guess I don't think, I don't know if the curriculum that we have now is the problem. It's what is it missing? 
you know, and, and like you said, the, the sociology, the psychology, hey, stupid thing, you like medical terminology. As a fellow instructor, how many times have you said, can you explain to me what hypothermia means? Like, can you break down those word roots? And they go, ah, well, I, um, er, you know, medical terminology, a full legitimate medical professional version of anatomy and physiology with a lab, you know, things that your, your other medical professionals don't not have. Yeah. You know, I I think back and I don't think I actually ever took a medical terminology class. Um, I don't know. I will say this. I think it, uh, as we look at the, B, the BS programs and, um, you know, it does make you more a little more well-rounded. And, you know, it's good to know the history, the the other sciences, philosophy, whatever. And, I mean, some of those classes, I think we both agree. Well, all three of us probably agree. There's some classes we took, like, you know, you had to take theater or some silliness, and you're like, what the crap? Right, right. But, you know, I mean, it, it helps. But um, I looked at some of these programs, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, I looked at about three or four of them, and I noticed the comparison. And first off, um... Three of all three of them had a if you're a, a paramedic you can get credit for this but you only have to take these classes and you can kind of like the uh, RN to BSN is it's yeah. like paramedic to BSN uh, but the biggest thing that I saw the difference and I think this is kind of the equivalent from going from an associate's nurse to a BSN is the management stuff understanding healthcare systems. Uh, management education kind of aspect, you know, how to really kind of manage EMS, maybe EMS systems, run education so that's programs. The problem. So, so a lot of that, so a lot of hospital administrators, and let me know if I'm off topic here, do not want to hire doctors anymore, at least as far as five, five years ago, to be actual run the hospital. Usually it was you have a hospital, you hire doctors, they run the hospital. They said, no more. Um, I know a doctor or two, so don't take this the wrong way, but doctors are not that good at business and they tend to ruin hospitals. So a lot of the what you're talking about, that administrative stuff, is becoming extremely valuable now, especially with the market changing with uh, the Affordable Care Act, etc. So I think you know, I'm not sure if what I'm saying is making any sense, but from a bachelor's perspective, there could be a lot of opportunities from that management side, especially business, to go higher within um, this industry. No, I think that's very uh, relevant. I think it's very important because, um, you know, we started this off by saying, let's add some structure. How is this going to affect the structure? And you talk about paramedics who – have a certificate. Okay, yeah, you can work in the field. If you want to be an FTO, you probably need to have an associate's degree. If you want to be a supervisor or you want to manage, you want to run the company, if you want to be that operations manager, right? yeah, you need to have a bachelor's degree. And I think that's kind of how it uh, adds to uh, the structure of things. And I don't know, do you agree with that, Boomer? Th that kind of model or something similar to yeah, I mean, I think I think any avenue for structure and for better integration of healthcare systems is a good thing. I mean, look at where EMS is going on the scope of community paramedicine and asking our providers to do more outside the field, outside the hospital. You know, the the era of simply knowing what your trauma center is, who has a CT scanner, and who can do dialysis is gone. You know, that's that's baseline medic 101 stuff. We're asking our providers to know a lot more, to be able to utilize urgent care offices in many instances and, and kind of incorporate mid-level providers in your care, especially on the community paramedic side of the coin. So I think a, a better fundamental aspect of maybe not necessarily the billing and coding and things of that nature, but definitely the healthcare system and what what you have in your district and what the the nationwide standard is, is definitely a good thing. The other aspect that I noticed was almost every single one of these programs had research as a class, and it taught how to do research. You know, man, today's EMS is research-driven. We're about evidence-based practice. We're, we're changing everything. Right. Um, I mean, do you not? Do you think this is important? 
Uh, I mean, to, st- st- yeah, stats was mandatory in in my pre med undergrad. No, not um, statistics. I'm talking about actual. They, it's, the classes are called research, and you do oh, yeah. research. And they teach you how to do research. Oh yeah, yeah no, statistics absolutely. sucks. No, I, mean, <laughs> I love math, and statistics sucks. I, but I think just on the same side as research, like you have to be able to interpret that data. <laughs> I think incorporating what well, I was tra- starting sense. to say was, you know, yeah. incorporating stats and research is huge when the biggest crux of EMS now is that evidence-based medicine, it, you should be able to know how to incorporate that. And I believe a lot of the BS programs that you're looking at in EMS are like specific for EMS managers and, and things of that front, at yeah. least, and I don't want to name colleges if I don't have them right in front of me, but some of those are, are specifically for those who want to become that manager, who want to move up in the management of their agency, where that's a huge aspect of what they'll now be tasked to do. Well, I'll what say- is evidence-based medicine? Like, what is that? It's, it's using actual data and science to justify what we're doing. You know, we're not just giving drug X because we've been giving drugs X since 1970. And we're giving said, drug X. Yeah, and somebody said it was a really good idea. We're giving drug X because we have a litany of science behind it that shows that it causes more positive outcomes than negative outcomes or has better benefits over drug Z. We're, we're, at, we're just validating what we do through statistical analysis and research. Oh, so that's over time. It's not if I if you guys are seeing a patient right now, I'm looking at okay x plus y plus c plus one, you know squared equals this. So therefore, I do this. No, no, no. I think we're we're always going to be bound by our protocols. But I think in the in the the utilization of evidence based medicine, our protocols will be more freer to change over time buy more real-time data. You know, what, what you have to understand, Marty, is, is for many of us, our protocols would change, what would you say, John, about every five years, maybe three to five years, depending on your state, and it would say, oh, this is good, this is bad, we're giving this, we're doing that, we're not doing that, when the paramedics that kept their finger on the pulse, terrible pun, I'm sorry, of all of that, knew years beforehand that we shouldn't be giving this drug, there's no data that shows that this is effective, but I have to do it because my medical director will yell at me if I don't. Well, That's I think a good example would be... Have you heard of uh, Moore's Law? What? Moore's Law. Do you know Moore's Law? What is mm-hmm. that? It's like um, the technology um, doubles every 18 months or so. And it may be kind of data storage, but essentially what it says is in every 18 months, technology will double. It will make things go faster every eight, certain amount of time, right? So what I'm listening to you guys saying, you know, every three to five years, it changes. But I know from a technological standpoint and what can be done is changing so much more faster than that. So like that from a medicine standpoint, especially the technology is changing faster than EMS is changing every time. Yeah. And so if I'm waiting, three, I just Googled it because I was just curious and I just Googled it. And yeah, was I I right? Yeah, it says, uh, Basically, it says, yeah, that uh, computer hardware doubles approximately every two years, like the yeah. the way it changes. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, yeah. Uh, this is master's degree showing. Yeah, yeah. it's the master's degree showing, yeah. That's the good stuff. Well, it's interesting. So, yeah, so from an educational standpoint, is that going to just change everything sooner than later? Or how does that work? Especially, so... You know, in some industries, you're having these baby boomers that are sitting at the top of the field, right? And you have these yeah, most of the old guys in EMS now are baby boomers, yeah. Yeah. And you got you, you guys coming up, boomer, right? So you're more quicker. You can learn more information. You're using this more often and all that stuff. So how does that change the educational aspect of what people know, what people can do, um, all that stuff? Am I way off on the question or what? No, I I think, I mean, you have to remember that we can't just go, we can't find one awesome article and and John and I work with a colleague and try out is all about, yeah, yeah. He's all about evidence-based medicine. He's all about research. And he's like, oh my God, the next big drug, the next big drug. He can't take it to work with him and give it to somebody. You know, we still need, we still need a protocol subset. We still need a group or a, a board of medical directors, physicians, et cetera, who approve everything we do, I think what evidence-based medicine is doing, or, or what my hope is, is that it's streamlining that process. You know, look at the American Heart Association. We just had 
our next big update from 2010 to 2015. And one of the things that the updates talks about is streamlining the information as it comes. You know, the American Art Association utilized research from three years ago in their 2015 update that we couldn't use until it was given in the update. So right. when they, when you talk about that, you know, the, the International Committee on Resuscitation and how they utilize information and distribute it to providers and to healthcare systems, I think you're going to notice that that's going to start to be streamlined more because of the wider availability of data and because of how we're utilizing that information to better manage our patients and to improve our patient care. I think as we communicate a little bit better within EMS, the fluidity of change is going to be a lot better. You know, you said five years, and I was thinking, yeah, five years sounds about right because, uh, you know, maybe some places, you know, they might update their protocols every year, but or they have updates on the classes or whatever, but really, do they really change that much? Uh, probably Five not years a is a long time. Right. Yeah. In all honesty, I, in all honesty, I see I see a future in pre-hospital medicine where, when new studies come out, when things change within medicine, EMS will change with them, not one, two, five years behind everybody else. Right. Right. We just haven't no. gotten there yet. We just haven't gotten there yet. And I think education, our base level education, and what we require of our practitioners is going to be a big. Uh, factor in that you know our big shift in 2010 when they came out with the new education was we want to be seen as professionals we're tired of being called ambulance drivers people still call us ambulance drivers because they don't know and I don't think they'll ever know what our level of education is and what we're required to do but at the same time as a field we're still going to be better for the education whether the public still calls us ambulance drivers or not right and I, I mean you know People still, people still slap nurses on the ass. I mean, I, I think that there's, really, that there, are, there are people that can't, that can't escape their own, <laughs> yeah, and their, yeah, they and their own ignorance, which is a felony, by the way. You can't yeah. assault a nurse; it's a felony. And in many states, you can't assault a paramedic either. That's also a felony, which is a bonus. Yeah. It's um, most states. Yeah, yeah, which is good because it wasn't for a long time. Just no. to really mess with you. Punching a nurse wasn't a big deal, or punching a paramedic until you, you know, got to a state where that was a felony. But. Uh, I think that instead of focusing, and I know you and I have talked about this quite a bit, instead of focusing on public perception of us and how we can change it, let's just change it by being better, more educated healthcare providers. Because I, I think if if the vast majority of public see good professional representatives of their agency, and in no way, shape, or form throughout this entire webcast have I tried to you know, illustrate that not having a degree makes you an incompetent paramedic versus somebody with a bachelor's degree being wicked smart because it's not how it works. But when we talk about changing the professionals of VMS, we need to start by changing our professionalism and how we show ourselves to one another. You know, you and I talked about this last week. How many disheveled, torn up, half asleep paramedics sit there and bitch, well, they called me an ambulance driver. Well, you look like a homeless person. You should be lucky they called you an ambulance driver. Yeah. You know, if we if we change how we represent ourselves as a profession, then as we develop more certificates, more board credentialing, more governing bodies to super to oversee what we do and how we do it, the rest of that will fall into place. And we make everybody follow the same exact standard. Sure. You got you got to start somewhere. You have to standardize something. Yeah. I don't know where somewhere is. I really don't. I don't know what entry level needs to be. You know, it's so there's everywhere you work, but we do need to standardize somewhere. There's 50 different states, and that means that there's 50 different opinions about that. And when they, and within each one of those states, there's another 50, 100, 500 thousand different ideas about that too. And I think until we all kind of read the same book, get on the same page, it's it's going to be that way for a while. It's getting better. I, I, I yeah. think it is getting better. It's it's just a hard, uh, as they say, it's a hard road to hoe. So they don't say that in Massachusetts, but I, I gotcha. Yeah, they said that. Down. So here's the problem that I have, not to bring up anything politically uh, with governing bodies. So I do appreciate that, that that there are 50 states, and I do appreciate that each of those 50 states has their own rules. The reason why 
is there's opportunities to innovate and try things out. So, you know, in Texas, which obviously is the best state on the face of the earth, you know, once we've become our own country. But aside from that, I mean, look at Colorado. Colorado can experiment with the marijuana law and all that stuff where Texas doesn't have to. We can see what Colorado's doing and then decide after that, right? You fell and hit your head, didn't you? <laughs> your daddy dropped you on your head when you was a kid, right? <laughs> I'm just messing with you about tech. No, I'm just messing what I'm trying to say is, like, if there's a governing body, what happened, what's going to tend to happen is five years it takes to change it. Instead of, hey, all right, let's, let's try something out and see what happens. Obviously, we don't want people dying, but let's see what happens and go with it. And then other states can adapt fairly fast, so it doesn't take five years. It takes six months, one year, bam. Now we're doing things better, better, better. The education is getting better, better, better. People are making more and more money because people are perceiving them in a higher light, right? I don't think, though, that we should have have it where each state kind of has their own thing. Because uh, right, we already have that, and it's not working. Yeah, it's not really working. And the problem with well, that from is – from a certificate is, standpoint, not from a protocol standpoint. No, I – No, I'm with you. Yeah, even still. It's, it, it's, it's different. It's a problem, and it and it's really like that because really? yeah, because well, okay, so uh, and I think we kind of had a little bit of this conversation before, but so I went from Alabama to Georgia. If the standard is the same, then there's no problem, and everybody's on the same page. If I go from Georgia to Texas, you know, I had an Alabama license. I moved to Georgia. I kept my Alabama license for a while because I was kind of driving back and forth across the line, uh, and then I just got too far from the Alabama line, so no, I let it fair. go. So, so, so now I have a Georgia, you guys I have a Georgia and a South Carolina, and it's like... I heard it. Yeah. Do what? We can move on. That's a, fair, we that's a good argument. All right. Okay. You good? All right. I think, I think and Marty, just to help clarify, I think what, what, what John and I are talking about was like making a bottom. Like, what is baseline? What is... When you say... Hi, my name is James, and I'm a paramedic. At whether you're, it's your first day of school or whether you've been a flight paramedic for 10 years, that's a horrible example. Whether you've been, you know, uh, your first day of school or you've been a field trainer for 10 years, what is the bare minimum that sh- the public should expect from you? What is the bare minimum you were taught in class? What is the bare minimum of this? And we have that. It exists. It's just horrible. Like the bare you know, minimum in many e- states see, is I- a real thing. I disagree. I disagree that the base is horrible. I think the application of the base is horrible. I don't think everybody follows the base, and that's the problem. All right. Well, sure. It's got to be utilized in order to be good. You know, I can't. I can't speak on states that I don't that I don't yeah. provide care in. But I, I don't. So to further your point, I don't see a good base a lot of places. When I look at somebody who's fresh out of school, I don't say there's a fine, young, adaptive eager to learn healthcare professional, I say, oh my God, was I that way 10 years ago? Because that's horrifying. How did more people not die? Yeah, we all were. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. I, I, so then maybe what we need to work on instead of changing the base is changing how that's taught and changing how our newest and up and coming utilize what they're taught. Maybe that's something we need to uh, talk about in another episode about how we uh, approach as a uh, peer group, how we approach our uh, our young, yeah, our young. Instead of eating our young, maybe uh, training them up a little bit better, having yeah, a different yeah. approach. Yeah, that'd be cool. I just came from a place that didn't eat their young that actually worked really hard to train them, and it was a good experience. I will say I've seen both, and uh, sometimes it works on both scales. But in all honesty. Yeah, we probably need to be, we don't need to molly coddle them and hold their hand and all this stuff, but I think, yeah, we need to do a little better job than we're doing. <laughs> so, that's fair. Yeah. Anything else there, Marty D? No. I think you guys, every time we do this, I learn more and more and more, and it gets more and more complicated. Yeah. EMS is complicated, sense. man. It True. Is. So it's tough. And then obviously the way that I'm looking at it now is obviously I get annoyed when I have to stop and pull over and some guy's running his lights and driving by, right? Because I miss a red light and that, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so now I'm looking at it as, you know, the education that you guys have, 
you need to acquire in order to save somebody's life, right? And you all have the save dates or whatever they're called. If you don't have that education, what if it's me? And what if the guy goes to get the certificate and comes to see me in an hour and doesn't have that baseline that you're talking about and now I die? I'm not a fan of that. You're going to haunt the shit out of that guy, yeah. Yeah. So, like, this worries me a lot. You know, as EMS educators, I think it worries us too, uh, especially in – The problem you know, is – so here's the problem. No one thinks about EMS until one, until they have the worst day in their life or right. in traffic. Right. Those two oh, – the only two reasons, right? Traffic. Well, you read it in the news that something really bad happened because somebody didn't do what they were supposed to do. Yeah, right. and I think that's – I think that's universal for civil service altogether. You know, you talk about firefighters unions and they'll tell you, like, you'd pay firefighters $4 an hour if you could, right? Because you only need them when a house burns down. Yeah. And then, you know, a, a unionized representative has come together and be like, no, if you need these people to stay trained, stay healthy, stay fit, stay active and do what they need to do to be able to save your life, then you have to pay them a livable wage while they're there. And that's a whole other discussion for another day. But I think, I think there's two problems here. I think... We know that there are huge gaps in our education that can be filled or at bare minimum improved. I think that we need to do that to increase our professionalism within the healthcare community. But I think it's also important to remember that whether you went to Bob's backyard or the prestigious university of most amazing paramedics ever, there are fantastic providers out of all those programs and there are terrible providers out of all those programs. Yep. I, I think it's, it's all about can we bump up our baseline? You know, can we make our worst paramedic a little bit better? Because our great paramedics are already doing it. They're already studying. They're already researching. They're already doing all this on their own time anyway. How can we bump up? It is amazing things? to see that you guys do that because I had no idea until I'm talking to you guys. I think Alan Blatt, right? Clint. I never knew that you guys did this much research, looked into this, what you guys are doing, and did your own education on your own, like quite thoroughly, I, right? Yep. Versus kind of all the other few. I had no idea. And so there's a, there's got to be a big gap between what you guys are doing and kind of the bottom rung that's like, I just need to pass this test. We've just got to figure out how to close that gap. I think that's probably the, that's the, that's the answer to that out, question. Right? That's what? the other thing. Do what? Or kick more people out. So I'd be they, okay with that. If they cannot pass a test, then. Yeah, I, I, maybe our weed out process should be a little more rigorous. Sometimes I think the weed out process is EMS, EMS itself. When they find out after about two days of just, just being beat the crap down and they figure out that maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be, maybe that's not the best time for them to find out that out. But yeah, we need to cro close the gap. And I think, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Probably figure out a different weed out process, but how you come up with that, I don't know. Yeah. So what do you think, James? Uh, have we uh, have we decided is college is the college degree the first step, or is that the answer, or what is the college degree in this equation? As I we kind of start wrapping up here. Yeah, I think it's in the equation of what the first step should be. I I personally don't think that you have to have a degree to make it good, but I think it's a very easy way to improve our education. All righty. I, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, as someone who has uh, taken a crap ton of college-level classes, uh, yeah, I am a couple of classes short of uh, some science degrees. And, uh, you know, I, does it make me a better provider? I don't know. Does it make me a better person? I don't know. I know a lot of crazy stuff. But uh, I think we've got to figure out as a peer group that – uh, how to make this work for us and how to close that gap. Let's and call that's it a class two intervention, right? Can't hurt my health. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. Well, all righty. Um, that is really all the time we have for this week. Guys, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like and share us on Facebook and Twitter. Go to our website, mediclifetv.com to get the latest information and updates. And guys, if you hung around to the end, yes, we have a special code for you. MedicLife2016 is the code to get you a discount 
on your continuing education, and you can find that, and the link will be in the old uh, description there of where you can go, but not the code. And the place you can go to is www.distancecme.com. Medic Life 2016 is your discount code. Guys, be that well-informed lifer and get on the lifers list. Marty? I am Marty with a D from Houston, Texas. Marty with a D from Houston, Texas. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us here, Boomer. From me here in Augusta, Georgia, guys, thanks for watching another episode of Medic Life. Y'all stay safe out there. Take care.